Thank you, guys. I'm going to share a bunch of slides with you, and I will just start out. Let me get to this one, where we are as a nation. We start, we have a constitution. Um, many nations, all nations have a form of government. This year, there's 193 nations at the UN. They all have a form of government, and it's very interesting. When you look across history, we have 5,800 years of recorded history. In those 5,800 years, you have thousands of nations that existed. When you look at the average of history, what's the average length of a constitution in the history of the world? And Harvard, or Cornell University Law School said, we'll check that. And they went through and they said, the average length of a constitution in the history of the world runs 17 years. Last September 17th, on Constitution Day, we had 234 years. Yeah. Now, that's, that's nowhere close to average. And by the way, the average nation not only has a new constitution every 17 years, they have a violent revolution every generation. So we look at what's going in Ukraine, and we say, man, that's tragic. It is tragic, but it's actually average. It's normal. This is what goes on. They had one back in 92. They've got one now. Uh, seven years ago, when Putin tried to, uh, when, he, when he went after Crimea, um, I was asked to go to Ukraine and help them write a new constitution because they said, our last one's in 1992. It's really old. We need something new. You know, <laughs> that was seven years ago. So what we have, most people in America don't recognize how special this is. But when you look at what we have, where'd those ideas come from? Because every other nation has had access to the same set of ideas. It's not like we came up with something brand new. Now, we certainly use things other nations had not been using, but they weren't new ideas. The Bible tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. Same ideas have been out there for generations, for millennia. So where did our founding fathers who wrote our documents get these ideas? That was a question that was asked by political science professors at the University of Houston. They looked and they said, okay, the guys who wrote our declaration, our constitution, this has made us really unique. This has made us really different from other nations. Where'd they get those ideas? And they said, we think that if we could go back into the founding era and read writings, representative writings from the founding era, and see who they quote, we'll know where they got their ideas, which is brilliant idea. If I followed you around all day with a smart device and recorded everything you said, at the end of the day I would see who you quoted, I wouldn't know who's important to you. And so what they did was they took 15,000 writings out of the founding era, and by the way, they published their results in this book, The Origins of American Constitutionalism. They took 15,000 writings out of the founding era, they went through and found all the quotes, and they found a total of 3,154 direct quotes. They said, now let's find out where those quotes came from. And it took them 10 years to do so, but at the end of 10 years, they had documented the most frequently cited sources in American founding. The number one cited most individual, was, the most cited individual was this man. This is Baron Charles Montesquieu. He's a, a French Christian. He's a writer. He wrote The Spirit of the Laws in 1750. This is where we learned a lot about separation of powers, which is really important. The second most cited individual in the founding era was Judge William Blackstone. Judge William Blackstone wrote a four-volume set called Commentaries on the Laws. Thomas Jefferson said American attorneys studied commentaries on the laws the same way Muslims studied the Koran. I mean, we were into that book. It's the second most cited source, uh, most cited individual in the American founding. The third most cited individual is John Locke. John Locke wrote the two treatises of government. And when we wrote the Declaration of Independence, that was hands down the most significant source. As a matter of fact, in one of the Declaration of Independence, uh, a guy named Richard Henry Lee, he said we copied the Declaration of Independence from the two treatises of the government. So that's how influential it was. So these are the three most influential individuals in where we get ideas in the American founding. But the most cited source, not individual, most cited source was the Bible. 34% of all quotes in those founding writings came out of the Bible. So the Bible is the number one influence in what shaped the thinking and the foundations where they got their ideas. That's why we're different from other nations. We built on a foundation that's proven to be timeless. Any other nation could have done that because the verses we found in the Bible and use, anybody could find in the Bible and use. And, and so we're going to talk about that for a little bit. And, and by the way, what we have had in America for those 234 years really is different. Not only do we have the stability of 234 years, but we have a level of creativity that the world's never experienced. America is 4% of the world's population, and 4% of the world's population should produce 4% of the world's whatever. In our case, our 4% of the world's population, when it comes to measuring creativity, and you can measure that through copyrights and patent protections, whatever, 
when you look at science and technology and medicine and, and cures and, and space and all the things that are out there, our 4% of the population has produced more than 96% of all the world's inventions. So we live with a level of convenience that nobody else has. As a matter of fact, um, we've got two kids active duty army right now, and I've done a lot for military. I do a lot of training for, for all branches and go to various posts and various forts and various air bases and do training. And, and I was asked by the Army, would I go to Germany and do some training there? Because I think we got 27 or 28 bases in Germany. I said, sure, I'll go there. And so when I got to Germany, it was a really special tr treat for me because I'm a cowboy from Texas. I mean, literally that. We have the ranch, we have the horses, we have the boots, we have the pickup, everything that goes with being a cowboy. That's, that's my life. And so it's really simple. I like it really simple. Uh, I like all the stuff that goes with it. And so when they got us to Germany, they put me up in a five-star German hotel. And that was really cool. Never experienced that. It was, an, it was the old world elegance. It's all those castles and all the stuff. And the, the level of service. I mean, as soon as I would walk in the door, the first staff person that saw me called me by name. Oh, Mr. Barton, welcome back. Is there something we can give? I've never had service like that ever anywhere. And it was such a cool five-star experience, and it would have been a lot better five-star experience if they would have had internet at that hotel. It had been a lot better. May I point out, every Motel 6 in America has internet. <laughs> See, we live with a level of lifestyle that we don't comprehend how unusual it is. And even if you look at where we are with prosperity, uh, every year, America, with our 4% of the world's population, produces somewhere around 23, 24, 25% of the world's GDP, and that has a direct impact on every life in America. If you look, for example, at the census, we do the census every 10 years required by the Constitution. We did it in 2020. 2021, they released the results. And according to the results of the l most recent census, if you live in poverty in America, and we don't want anyone to live in poverty in America, but if you live in poverty in America, according to the census numbers, your lifestyle is higher than the middle class in Europe, which is the second wealthiest place on the face of the earth. The World Bank sets the global standard for poverty, and the World Bank says $1,000 a year. If you make $1,000 a year or less, you live in poverty, and that's for the whole world. In America, we have states like Hawaii, states like Mississippi, and they specifically tell you, unless you can make more than $61,000 a year, you should not come off government services because what you get on government services. Wait a minute. 61000 here, 1000 for the rest of the world. See, we have a standard of living we don't even understand. And comparative, you know, we don't want anyone living in poverty. But, oh, my goodness, this is why everybody in the world is lining up on the borders of America. If they can just come here and if they can just live in poverty here... They've elevated their lifestyle higher than anything else they've ever known. Just living in poverty here. See, we've been blessed. And, and by the way, nations back even 200 years ago knew how different we were. There was a man who came to America in 1831. Uh, he came here to look particularly at our justice system because he was a justice official from France. He wanted to see what made our justice system different. And he got intrigued with the whole nation. So it turned out they traveled the nation for eight months. And eight, four years later, he came out with a big book called Democracy in America. It's Alexei de Tocqueville. And in it, he gave us the term American exceptionalism. He said the conditions of the Americans are quite exceptional. And it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar state. He said what these guys have is just exceptional. Now, we hear the term today when we use it, academics and, and professors say, oh, America's not exceptional. It's like we're bragging, look at us, we're exceptional. It's not what it means. American exceptional means we're the exception, not the rule. When it comes to the stability that we enjoy, that's the exception. That's not the rule. What we have is exceptional. When it comes to prosperity, what we have is exceptional. When it comes to productivity, what we have is exceptional. So American exceptionalism... And where did that come from? Because, again, every nation in the world has access to the same set of ideas that we used. So where did it come from? Well, I would have to say the guys who gave us our documents, the leaders who gave us our documents, we can thank them for it. And that would be, you look back at the guys who did the Constitution Declaration and say George Washington and his people like John Hancock and people like John Adams, and all those are really important. However, it's very interesting to me that John Adams, who was so much a part of, of shaping what has blessed millions of Americans for over two centuries, 
1816, he was approached by a young man named Hezekiah Niles. Hezekiah Niles is what we would call a millennial of that generation. He was the younger generation. He had not been there for the American War for Independence, but in 1816, he's loving what America had become because even back then, we were so much more stable. Just in George Washington's two terms of office, France went, through, France went through three revolutions. I mean, this is the world. They called that the age of revolution. You had the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the Russian Revolution. Everybody's having a revolution except us. So even by 1816, we've already become an exceptional nation in the world. And Hezekiah Niles, is, he says, I'm writing a history book on America. He said, I wasn't there when it was formed, but we sure enjoy what we've had since then. But Mr. Adams, you were there. Say it was 42 years earlier. When he wrote it, he said, 42 years ago, you signed the Declaration of Independence. So you were there. You were part of what went on. You saw what went on. You know where this stuff came from. So as I'm writing this book, and the book came out in 1822. It's called Principles and Acts of the American Revolution. He says, I'm writing this book. I want to ask you, what shaped your thinking? Where did you get these unique ideas? And John Adams says, well, if you want to know where we got the ideas, what shaped our thinking, he said, Right up top, I put the Reverend Dr. Samuel Cooper. And then behind that, the Reverend Jonathan Mayhew, and of course, the Reverend George Whitfield. Oh, and don't forget the Reverend Charles Chauncey. Goes through and lists preachers. Now, we might know who George Whitfield is, but the chances that we know anything about Cooper or Mayhew or Chauncey, that's slim to none. See, we don't study preachers today, even though that's what they said back then. We don't cover this in history. And by the way, we don't cover preachers today, whether they're white or black. I mean, who in the world is Richard Allen or Absalom Jones or who's John Moran or Lemuel Haynes or who's Harry Hoosier? We don't have a clue. Let me just take Harry Hoosier for a minute. Harry Hoosier was in the Great Awakenings. Now, you think about the Great Awakenings, and if you know much about revivals in America, you know that, well, that's the George Whitfields, and that's the John and Charles Wesley, and, and that's Francis Asbury, and that's all these famous guys, and they all had huge crowds. They would get 20, 30, 40,000 people to get in the pasture, and they'd preach to this master Clara. And Francis Asbury said, Harry draws larger crowds than I do. Really? That's big. And Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration, and by the way, out of 250 or so founding fathers that we have, uh, John Adams said that the three most notable founding fathers was number one, George Washington, number two, Ben Franklin, number three, Benjamin Rush. Now, we don't know this guy today either. He started the first abolition society in America, started the first Bible society in America. He started the Sunday school movement in America, started five universities in America. He's called the father of American medicine. He, trained, he did the first academic training for women. He trained black physicians. He just did all sorts of things that makes him just really remarkable for what he did. But he said, I've attended Harry's meetings. He said, Harry is the greatest orator I have ever heard. Now, wait a minute. You're running around with people like Patrick Henry and all these famous orators, and Harry's better than them? Yep. You see, Harry had a ministry to what we would call the blue-collar people. Back then, and the guys that really liked him were the explorers and the trappers and the frontier guys, the woodsmen, the guys that called long hunters. A long hunter is someone who would go out on a hunting trip and come back six to eight months later off that hunting trip. I mean, they'd, just, they'd wander everywhere and discover something new and find new rivers or mountains or whatever. And, and these were the guys that liked Harry, but they were rough and tumble guys. They're rugged guys. They cussed a lot. They drank a lot. They fought a lot. But they really liked Harry. And when they got converted, their life would change. They didn't cuss so much. They didn't drink so much. They didn't fight so much. So they would get changed. Now, Harry's ministry was along the East Coast. He preached in Philadelphia. He preached here in Jersey. He preached up in, in, in Delaware. And, and so Harry has this ministry here. But as America starts expanding over the years and starts moving west, by the time you get to 1805, 1806, 1807, America, we've moved a lot further west. And these explorer guys, they all go with it because this is what they love. They love the hunting and fishing and trapping and, and finding it. And so, as they all get there, there they are. And, and, and they look at around and they see these converts that, that have come, these hunters and explorers. And they said, man, those guys are really different. What's up with them? And the answer is, <laughs> they're a bunch of those Hoosiers. <laughs> yeah. Indiana Territory? Who's your state? I wonder how many people who live in Indiana know that they were named after a black evangelist. <laughs> you would think that a guy who has a state named after him might show up in somebody's history book. See, this is the kind of stuff we don't get today. And it's not that it didn't exist, it's just that we don't know it. I might point out, you know, one of the things in the last two years have been critical race theory. And there's been all this opposition, all this pro and, and the big fight over. 
We weren't having critical race theory 30 years ago. Why was that? Because we still knew more of our history than we know today. You see, we could talk about some... Today, we're, we're told, oh, the American founding was a bunch of white guys. So it was an all-white founding. Do you know why we know what these guys look like? Because they painted paintings of them back then. There certainly wasn't cameras, but they painted paintings of them. Why did they paint paintings of them? Because they were really famous. You see, only really famous people got paintings done of them. It's, it's not your average citizen that, that got a painting. You got to be really significant. Isn't it interesting that we have so many paintings of black heroes from the founding era? Now, most of us today can't put names to these guys, but they were painted because they were significant and made major contributions. We just don't know. The guy at the bottom right, Jack Sisson, the guy above him, Benjamin Banneker and Richard Allen and, and, and Harry Hoosier and John Chavez here and Lemuel Haynes there and James Armistead and up in the, the, the Battle of Lexington is Prince Estabrook. And right below that is William Nell and, and over on the left side, Wentworth Ches. We don't know who these guys are. There are so many black heroes that were such heroes, they were national figures. For example, the guy at the bottom left on horseback went with Cheswell. He, a black man, elected in New Hampshire to office in 1768. Elected in a white community, re-elected for the next 49 years. He held eight different political positions. He's considered a town father of, of that part of, of New Hampshire. He's the great historian of New Hampshire who kept all the records, put all the stuff together for the history. He also did a Paul Revere type of ride, warning the patriots that the British are coming. And he was the head of the military com committee in the community. Uh, it's a black guy elected by a bunch of whites, absolutely, just like Thomas Hercules was in Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, back up to Maryland in 1641, where Matthias de Sousa is elected in 1641 as a black man elected by a white community. May I point out, Great Britain did not elect anyone black to office until 1987. May I further point out, Russia didn't do it until 2010. We did it in 1641. We're the worst nation in the world when it comes to racism. Only if you don't know our history. Now, we... We've got lots of racism in America. You know why? Because we've got lots of people in America. See, racism and people go together, but it's Christians who get past it faster than anybody else. And this is more of a Bible nation than any other, which is why the first area in the entire world, in the history of the world, to abolish slavery were the northern colonies. By 1804, every northern colony had abolished slavery. Nobody did it before that. 1807, March of 1807, America passed the first law banning the international slave trade. Nobody did it before America. 1819, we appropriate and we put the U.S. Navy off the coast of Africa, what was called the Africa Squadron. We put them to cruise the coast of Africa to keep other ships from other nations going there to take slaves out of Africa. Now, we didn't stop all the, sh all the ships that came because that's thousands of miles on that coast, but we stopped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ships. That, that Africa squadron stayed off the coast of Africa until uh, 1861 when, we had, when the Civil War erupted and, and got to fight the South, and so they pulled the, the Navy back to be able to fight the Confederate Navy. Great Britain stepped in and said, we'll do it. We'll try to stop as many as we can. And so, and by the way, Great Britain is the first nation in the world to ban slavery. They did it in 1833. People act like slavery's been banned since the beginning of time, and we're the only ones that had it. They did it in 1833. America actually banned slavery in 1865. Now, the northern states by 1804. It took a while to get the south around there. When we banned slavery in 1865, there was 128 nations in the world. We became the fourth nation in the world to ban slavery. We weren't the first. But we're certainly at the top of the list on, on banning slavery. And we started it. We, didn't, we just couldn't get the South to go along with it. We started what became the global abolition movement. And then when you look at things that, that, that happened, like the African slave trade run from, eight, from 1501 to 1875, 12.7 million Africans involuntarily taken out of Africa. We do a lot of baits with professors and others. And we had a student recently tell us, he said, my professor just told me that all of those 12.7 million slaves came to, to America. Is that right? I said, no. 47% of those slaves went to Brazil. 26% of those slaves went to Great Britain. 11% went to France. 10% went to D Denmark. 2.5% came to America. Now, 
we didn't need to take 2.5%, but I'll point out that is one of the lowest nations in the world for that. And if you're really concerned about slavery, may I point out that today there are 193 nations in the world and 94 of them still have not abolished slavery. Do you know there's 40 million active slaves in the world tonight? There's 9.2 million in Africa. There's millions in China. We know 3 million for sure. We don't know how many more because China is not open with records, but there's 40 million tonight. And we want to talk about 400 years ago and how bad we were. If you really are concerned with that, let's look at what's going on right around us right now. Let's get the other 94 nations to ban slavery. Wouldn't that be a good start? No, see, we're focused on talking about how bad America is. And, I, and I'm telling you, we've got lots of problems. There's no question because you see in the Bible, what we learn from the Bible is that when you look at history, you're supposed to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. David's a great example. David's a great worshiper. He has a heart after God. He's a great warrior, great patriot for his nation. And he's the lousiest father in the Bible. Absalom, he never told Adonijah no, is what Chronicles tells us. Absalom created a revolution. And Amnon, David's son, raped David's daughter, which Absalom went and killed his brother. I mean, David's a lousy father. And on top of that, he kills Uriah and sleeps with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. So you've got good and bad and ugly. But you see, there's a whole lot more good than there is bad and ugly. And the bad and the ugly, he repented of and got out of it. If we only studied the bad and the ugly today, none of us would ever read another psalm out of the Bible forever. Who wants to read something that was written by a murderer who went and slept with someone's wife and can't even keep his kids straight? But we know that's not the whole story. But see what happens in America today. We talk about the bad and the ugly, never talk about the good. And if you look at the whole thing, there's a lot of bad. And by the way, let me give one more sh shout out on an issue that's going on. I think you all know about the 1619 Project. New York Times released it, 1619. They picked that because they said that's when slavery began in America, 1619. Time out. We own 160,000 original documents in American history. Uh, we just bought the largest collection of Pilgrim Century documents. They go from Columbus over the next century or so. And it's interesting that on this, in those original documents, you find that slavery, the Spanish introduced slavery into the Carolinas in 1526. That's a long time before 1619. The Spanish also introduced slavery into Florida in 1545. That's a long time between 1619. 1619, there were, it's debated whether it's 19 or 20 slaves that were landed in Virginia in 1619. But Virginia said slavery is illegal in Virginia. We can't do this. And so they all became landowners given land by the state. They all became free. And one of those guys, Anthony Johnson, became a free landowner. He became very prosperous. Black man is very prosperous. He has people working for him on, on his various pieces of property. And one's a guy named John Kaser. And he said, John Kaser is the most worthless individual I've ever seen. So here you have Anthony Johnson, black man. John Kaser's working for him. And John Kaser went to the court of Virginia and said, can I own this guy for the rest of his life? It'll take him that long to pay off the debts that he, he owes me. Just let me own the guy. And so the court of Virginia said, okay, you can do that. So the first occasion of slavery in America is 1653 when a black man sues to own another black man. That's not the 1619 Project narrative we hear. And the 1619 Project could not have been introduced even 20 years ago because we still knew too much about our history. So just show you some examples of where things have changed. And, and by the way, in, in addition to, I mean, it was not a white founding. In the American War for Independence, it was a complete volunteer arming. Every battle in the American War for Independence was an integrated battle, and black soldiers volunteered nine times longer, nine times more often than white soldiers did. That's why we have so many black heroes back then. But in addition to that, we don't even recognize Jewish heroes today, like Chaim Solomon. He's one of the guys who personally funded George Washington staying in the field, because when Washington leads an army out there, it's a bunch of school teachers and a bunch of farmers and a bunch of shopkeepers, and they're taking on the number one military in the world. You know any bank that's going to give a loan on that? There's no way. When you looked up in the dictionary, bad risk, the picture was of the founding fathers because they were bad risk. There's no way they're going to win this thing. He kept them funded and in the field, kept George Washington out there. And if you go to the Chicago Financial District, you find this statue there. It's George Washington holding the hand of a Jewish man, Heinz Solomon, and the hand of a Christian man, Robert Morris, because of those two guys, the guys who came up with the funding to be able to keep him in the field until the French decided they would help us and other nations help us. Christian and Jew, right there side by side. 
and so many Christian founding father patriots as well. Colonel Isaac Franks, one of the, the leaders in the American War for Independence, as was his brother David Franks. And then you have Francis Salvador, who's the first Jew elected to office in America, 1775. And he also becomes the first Jew to die for America. He was a patriot in the Revolution, was killed by the British, was actually murdered by the British. You've got people, in addition to Salvador, Mordecai Scheftel, Jewish leader who's leader of the Patriot Forces in Georgia, all sorts of things about Christians and Jews that we don't hear at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the American War for Independence and look at all the famous Jewish soldiers and look at even the synagogue leaders who went out and fought for independence, it doesn't look like it's a real Christian white list. And as a matter of fact, if you go further than that, you look at George Washington's presidential inauguration. In his inauguration, there were seven religious activities. That's the most of any presidential inauguration ever. Every other presidential inauguration has had five or six or three or four. Nobody's had seven, but all the others have had part of what George Washington did. Washington's inauguration was planned by 14 religious leaders that were made up of both rabbis and ministers. So Christians and Jews planned that inauguration. Most religious activities ever came from there. And the Christian Jewish Corporation is something we hear. And then when you look at Washington's generals, this is a famous lithograph of his generals that came out and spread all over Europe. Shortly after the American War for Independence, it shows Washington and his generals, except all the generals shown there are foreign generals. These are generals from Lithuania that came to fight for our freedom, from Poland who came to fight for our freedom, from Germany, uh, from France, from uh, the, the, the Prussian area. Out of Washington's 76 generals, 28 of them came from foreign nations. We were a melting pot back in the day. So this narrative that was all white, uh, nope, not at all. So it's very different. As a matter of fact, one final picture I'll show you on this. You've probably seen the picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware. That's not an American painting, and it wasn't done for Americans. This is a painting that was painted in Germany, and it was done for the Germans. And it was painted shortly after Marx came out with his book, Das Kapital, and, and he goes through and lays out Marxism. And Marxism is all about breaking people into groups and having those groups fight each other. So we've gone through this in America. We tried to make it genders, and then we tried to make it um, age, age stuff, and now we've made it race stuff. And Marxism, they don't care what groups it is. They just always need groups fighting because they think it's like being a boxer. They think that the more you fight, the stronger you get, and you can have another fight and get stronger. And so the more you're fighting, the stronger you get. Jesus has a different way. of He says a house divided won't stand. You can't be broken up and having those fights. It just won't last. And so the Marxist way is you need more fights. The more fights you have, the stronger you'll be, which maybe if you're a boxer, that's true. But when you're running a nation, that's not true. And so what was happening was Germany was starting to get all these factions, all these groups, and all these groups fighting one another. And the painter in Germany painted this to say, look, we need to be like America. He said, in America, everybody's in the same boat. I mean, he says, you've you got a woman right here, and you've got a black man right over here, and you've got a Scottish man here, and you have immigrants here, and you have this one back here, and you've got a trapper. He said, in America, everybody's in the same boat. That's the way it should be here in Germany. This was a pa painting done for Germany to show them how it was in America, and that's what they needed to do over there. So this is not a patriotic painting of Washington Cross in the Delaware. It is, but it's to show people we're all in the same boat together. We need to be like the Americans. So going back to John Adams, remember? He said it was these pastors, and he called them by name. We now can d document even today how right he was. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, Declaration of Independence, historians today have documented that every single right set forth in the Declaration of Independence had been preached from the American pulpit prior to 1763. You know what that means? It means you ought to try reading the Declaration of Independence as a listing of sermon topics because that's what they had been hearing for 15 years before they wrote the Declaration. So that just lists what they've been hearing out of the pulpit. And when you look at what's coming out of the pulpit, let's just do a little dive back on history because maybe you've already seen some things you didn't know before. Let me go even further to show you specifically what's happening today. I've been appointed in a number of states to do the history and social studies standards in those states. So state boards of education, et cetera, worked with governors. And just today received a, a, a communication from a, a different state that wants us to look over their standards. So when you look at what happens in history, there's a great quote from George Orwell where he says, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Two thoughts here. Who controls the past controls the future. What you have here is 
the way the past is seen is going to affect what we become in the future. So if we can make the past of America look really bad, we'll say we don't want to be anything ever like that. We want to be something totally different. That affects the future. The way you portray the past affects the future. But here's the other part. Who controls the present controls the past. See, this is what's going on in education right now. And this is why we're starting to see battles over education, because what we're teaching right now will affect whether America survives or doesn't survive. It will affect the way we portray our history. So with this quote from Orwell, let me give an example uh, of how this shaped out. Uh, there's what's called the College Board. Now, the College Board is what produces the SAT test, college entry test, but they also produce the AP test. An AP, if you're a student in high school and you're really sharp on a subject, you can get an AP class where you get college credit while you're still in high school. So the AP history test is taken by about 460,000 students a year. These are the top history kids in America, 460,000 of them. And to prepare for the test, you have these AP U.S. History Standards course and exam description, 162 pages. This is the 2014-2015 uh, edition that came out and so they said here's what you need to know if you're going to pass the test and get college credit you got to master these areas so in 162 pages of standards what's there better yet what's not there when I look at standards I don't necessarily look at what they have I look at what they didn't include because that tells me a whole lot about what's going to happen if, if I were to say to you Abraham Lincoln oops back up if I were to say to you Abraham Lincoln dropped an atomic bomb on Taiwan to end World War 18, you would all laugh at me as being stupid. Now, what happens is, if I didn't tell you anything at all about Abraham Lincoln, and I kept Lincoln out of the books for 30 or 40 years, I could come back 30 or 40 years from now and start telling you stuff about Lincoln, and you wouldn't know whether it was true or not, because I don't even know who Abraham Lincoln is. So when something is taken out, I look for that most because about 20, 30 years later, they're going to come back with something to replace it. So let me show you what is not in the 2014, 2015 standards when, when College Board put this out. You're not going to find founding fathers. There is no Thomas Jefferson. There's no Ben Franklin. There's no John Adams. There's no James Madison. By the way, there's no American birthing of independence. We don't have any Battle of Lexington, no Battle of Bunker Hill. There's no Battle of Saratoga. There's no Battle of Yorktown. We weren't born. We didn't fight for independence. And Lincoln didn't exist. And, and there's nothing like Lincoln Douglas debates or Emancipation Proclamation, Gettysburg. Lincoln wasn't even assassinated. And if there's no Lincoln, there's no Civil War. And so there's no Grant. There, there's no Lee. There's nobody fighting. There's not even a Civil War battle in it. And let's go to the 20th century for a minute. Let's take World War II. We don't mention a single battle in World War II, not D-Day, not Pearl Harbor, not Battle of the Bulge. We don't list a single military leader. There's no Eisenhower. There's no Patton. There, there's no MacArthur. There's no Nips. We don't even have an enemy. We didn't mention Hitler. We didn't mention the Nazis. And we didn't mention the Holocaust. All of this is going... This is AP history in 2014, 2015? Good question. What is in there? Let me show you. Here's an example of what's in there. It says, the decision to drop the atomic bomb raised questions about American values. Okay, you didn't have the Japanese, you didn't have the Germans, you only had the Americans, and we dropped an atomic bomb. Boy, are we the bad guys. So what happened? Raised questions about American... What are they talking about? Let me take you back for a little bit and show you something in World War II. In World War II, there were 68 million deaths in World War II. 20 million of those deaths occurred in the Pacific Theater, and 48 million of those deaths occurred in the, the European Theater. We finally brought the European Theater to an end when we had, had, it took us a while. When World War II started, we weren't ready for war. We were still flying biplanes from World War I, and we were still using destroyers and ships, steamships from World War I, because we, World War I, we called that the war to end all wars. We're never going to have another war, so we don't have to prepare for anything. So when it started, we were totally unprepared for war. It took us about two years before we could send forces into any major battle area, but boy, did America do a great job. Uh, we have a radio, daily radio program, about 400 stations, got a podcast. And we try about once a month to interview a World War II veteran because what they said, what they saw, and what they did back then is just, it's hard for us to understand. But one, we were interviewing a guy, and he said when he was in the war, he was the pilot of a B-24. He was 18 years old. Pilot of the B-24 means he's in charge of the crew. He said we had 10 people on the crew. He said we were all 18 except one guy who was 22, and we called him Pop because he was so old. 
He said that V-24 would take anything they threw at us. He said, I came back from one mission. I had 107 holes in the plane, and we flew back in and landed. And so he said, we were not prepared for war. He said, but Detroit was turning out a new bomber every 55 minutes, and we were turning out a new Liberty ship every four days. So when we geared up, man, did we gear up. American ingenuity. And may I make a silly comment here? 55 minutes, we can produce a new bomber. Four days, a new ship. Three and a half years, a website on health care. Yeah. <laughs> so, we finally get Patton and the first army at that time to, la to land over in Casablanca, North Africa. He works his way east across North Africa, gets in Sicily, into Sicily, goes up through, through Italy, and then we get ready for D-Day. And D-Day is where everything changes. We finally have enough forces and enough stuff to do something. So on D-Day, we land on D-Day. It's called Operation Overlord. At that point in time, we're able to drive Hitler back. We get the Battle of the Bulge. We defeat the Germans there, and we go through the Siegfried Line, and we put J Hitler back in Germany, and they surrender. So we uh, turn our attention to Japan. And what had happened was we had what was called the German First Strategy. We've got two, two enemies here. They're on opposite sides of the world. We're going to keep Japan busy, but we're going to turn everything toward defeating Germany. And so it was called the Germany First Strategy. Once we defeat Germany, once they surrender, we're going to go to Japan, which is what we did. So we sent planes and started bombing planes, B-29 strata fortresses. We're, we're going and bombing Japan, dropping thousands of bombs. And we're trying to get Japan to surrender, and they won't surrender. And it's a really weird thing because there were... Of all the nations of the world, 130 nations were involved in World War II. It literally was a world war. Japan is the only one left standing. All of her allies are gone. They've all been defeated, and she won't give up. And she has no passive, possible path to victory, nothing at all. And she won't give up. And, and so we said, man, if she won't give up, we, we might have to do a D-Day landing in Japan like we did in, with Hitler. We don't want to do that. It was called Operation Downfall. And they said, we might have to land. And they said, you know, if we land, it's going to be totally different from what happened in Europe because the, the, the Japanese culture was a culture that was really into death and dying. It glorified death. It was, it was the ISIS of that age. We quickly found that out back early in the war. The Japanese captured an American submarine. That American submarine surrendered, and the Japanese took every American sailor up on deck and laid them down on deck and took a sledgehammer and smashed every head just like a melon. And we said, uh-oh, this is a different kind of enemy. And so you'll find that they were a very different kind of enemy. Uh, as a matter of fact, as we started going through the island hopping and we do Guadalcanal and we do Iwo Jima, the Japanese gave every family on the island a hand grenade and said, if the Allies win the battle, blow yourself and your children up. Make sure that you don't live through this. And that's why if you look at all the Pacific Islands, the Japanese casualty rate is through the roof. They will kill themselves rather than surrender. And so this is what we were facing. They had the Chinese genocide, whereas uh, Hitler killed some six mi seven million Jews and some six million Gentiles. The, the Japanese killed 10 million Chinese, and the, they were brutal in what they did to the Chinese. And then on top of that, they trained their teenagers to be death agents. There were 3,400 teenagers who delivered suicide bombs, some with little planes where they'd fly into something, but even their torpedoes. I mean, they... Why don't you just point a torpedo at a ship and blow it up? No, no, no. We've got to drive it to the ship and blow ourselves up with it. So you're looking at a mentality. How do you defeat a mentality that doesn't mind dying and they don't mind how many casualties there were? And even the prisoner of war camps, the Japanese officers would have competitions to see who, who could be had 100 prisoners the fastest. And if it was a tie, they would have runoffs. Bring out another 10 prisoners and let's see if we can do them the fastest. So this was common in the Japanese prisoner of war camps where they had caught Americans and others. And so with all this going on, even when they captured Americans, not only did they kill all those sailors, but like Saipan and the, the uh, Bataan Death March, if you were an American soldier and you were wounded or you were sick or you were slow, they would just kill you on the spot. And, and so this is one of the war posters we had. It's called, This Isn't War, It's Murder, Japs Bayonet, U.S. Wounded, Ambushed on Pacific Island. So... It was the culture that glorified death and dying like nothing we had ever faced. And so we said, you know, if we have to do an invasion, if we have to land on Japan, it's going to be really bloody. 
And so General Curtis LeMay, who was in charge of the Army Air Corps, became the Air Force after the war, he said, if we have to invade, what are we looking at? And they said, well, you'll lose one million Americans. You'll lose somewhere between two and four million allies, the British and the French and the Belgium and the New Zealanders and, and Australia. And you're going to have to kill between five and 10 million Japanese before they surrender. So we're looking at 15 million. At that point, Harry Truman said, you know, last week we tried a bomb out in the desert and it really worked, so let's use that. And so that's where the atomic bomb came from. Uh, we dropped the first one on August the, the 6th of 1945, the second one on August the 9th of 1945 because the Japanese wouldn't give up. We were prepared to drop a third one on August the 12th of 1945, but the Japanese had come to the negotiating table, and so on the 14th of, of August they surrendered. So what we've got is we had all this, this stuff that was blown up and all the devastation there, and from those two bombs, 150,000 died immediately from the blast, and 150,000 more died from radiation within the next two to three years. So 300,000 died, and this is what ended the war. Let's compare that to what would have been 15 million. So what's the problem with American values? I'm, I'm not sure what question we've raised here about American values. And then on top of that, this is an Australian being beheaded. Do you know the Japanese in one prisoner of war camp beheaded more prisoners of war than we killed with two atomic bombs. So how are we the bad guys in this? Just one prisoner of war count. They beheaded more than we killed with two atomic bombs. Uh, I'm again not sure about what the question is with American values. And then when you look at the devastation that was caused, none of it had to happen because, you know, before we bombed any city in Japan, except for the Doolittle Raid, right up early to let Japan know that we're coming back later, we dropped a total of 70 million leaflets on the Japanese, we own leaflets. You can see it in our, our library. These leaflets on the back say Japanese city, Japanese people, here are the cities we're going to bomb. 35 cities we bombed. Here are the cities we're going to bomb. We're going to destroy military capabilities, but we do not want to hurt a single civilian. We're telling you where we're coming so you can get away from it because we will bomb the factories. We're going to stop the war, but we don't want to hurt any people. Now, in addition to doing that, this endangered American lives because guess where the Japanese set up all the anti-aircraft guns around those 35 cities? Our pilots had to fly and just, why not just bomb them and not tell them where we're going? And then on top of that, when it came time to drop the atomic bomb, we had taken the island of Saipan and we set up a radio station known as KSAI. Every 15 minutes, we broadcast, broadcast into Japan, the bomb is coming, get away from it. This bomb has the capability of what of what 2,000 B-29 bombers can do. You've seen what the bombing can do. This bomb will do what 2,000, get away. You, you gotta get away, we're dropping this big bomb. We told them every 15 minutes. And so again, I'm not sure about the question about American values and then even after we bombed them, we rebuilt them. Why? So what we're doing in history is America is a really bad nation. And what this is called is deconstruction. Instead of teaching the good, the bad, the ugly, you teach the bad and the ugly, ignore the good. And a lot of this started in the modern era with a guy named Howard Zinn, a professor who wrote this book, People's History of the United States. He not only showed you all the bad and ugly, he made up a lot of the bad and ugly. And this is what we've been teaching in schools for the last 40 years, which is why now if we talk about America being bad, everybody jumps on board and says, yeah, that's exactly what I was taught. This is where history is so significant. So I've, I've spent too long here. Let me, let me get past this. But this is where history becomes important to the future of a nation. So back to John Adams. He said, our pulpits have thundered. And when you look at the sermons back then, and we own thousands of these original sermons, when you look at what was preached back then by the preachers he talked about, you'll find it addressed biblical relevancy in a way that we're not used to seeing. For example, in, 1770, in 1755 in Boston, they had a major earthquake. Now, a major earthquake is not common in Boston, but it's on everybody's mind. It's in the newspaper. And so our belief was whatever people are thinking about or talking about, whatever's in the news, we need to show people how the Bible relates to that. So this sermon was done by the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew. It's a sermon on earthquakes and his discourse, that's a word for sermon, Revelation 15, verses 3 and 4, in November 1755. I thought about that and said, okay, if I hadn't preached a sermon on earthquakes, what could I do? Uh, I remember there's an earthquake in Chronicles with King Uzziah. There's an earthquake in the book of Amos. There's an earthquake when Jesus is crucified. There's an earthquake when he's resurrected. Got it. I can do a good 30-minute sermon on earthquakes. Good for me. Please notice at the bottom that's a five-week sermon on earthquakes. 
I can't come anywhere close. And I looked online recently, and I was shocked at the dozens of earthquakes that occur in the Bible. I just don't even remember. I've read the Bible how many times. I'm not used to looking for relevancy the way they did. So whether it was fires or whether it was floods or earthquakes that had sermons on it, uh, this is a sermon on comets, or as you see at the bottom, occasion, it's two sermons occasioned by the late blazing stars. We had so many sermons on astronomy, on solar eclipses, on lunar eclipses. We had ser sermons on discovery of new planets. Um, and why not? Because... The greatest scientists, the greatest astronomers in world history were also theologians like Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton and Copernicus and these guys. So we saw so much in the Bible. I mean, even the book of Job, God talks about the constellations by name, Pleiades and Orion, etc. So we had sermons on that. This is a sermon on the infirmities and comforts of old age. It's probably not a super popular topic, <laughs> but it's definitely a very needed topic. Everybody's going to grow old or deal with people who are growing old, so we had guidance on aging. This is a sermon on religion and patriotism, the constituents of a good soldier, so military sermons. And John the Baptist, even when he's baptizing, he has specific instructions for officers and soldiers. Think about all the military things in the Bible that you can learn from. And then we had sermons like this one. This is the relation of the medical profession to the ministry, a discourse preached in West Church, Boston, 1854, a sermon on health care. Let me quickly remind you about the Bible real quick. We get introduced to Abraham in Genesis 11. We know the lineage of Abraham. From Abraham, we have Isaac and then Jacob, and Jacob marries Rachel and Leah, and they produce 12 sons. And the most famous of the 12 sons, the one that gets the most coverage in the Bible, is definitely Joseph. Now, Joseph sold into slavery. Brothers thought he was dead. It ends up that he is, goes into Egypt and eventually rises to be second in command in Egypt. Then a world famine hits, and the brothers say, hey, we need food. Dad says, go to Egypt. They got food there. They eventually get reunited with their brother, who they thought was dad, who they had sold into slavery. And he says, how's dad? How's dad doing? He's doing good. Let's go see dad. So Joseph gets reunited with his father, who can't believe he's still alive. He's believed he's dead for years and years. And Joseph said, why don't you guys just come to Egypt? I've got good standing there. I've got a lot of influence. Go to Egypt. And so they all move and go to Egypt. And it works out really good for them for a while. And then you have pharaohs that forget who they are, and they get into slavery. And they're in slavery for 400 years. And after 400 years of enslaving God's people, God sent Charlton Heston to free them. And so, oh, not bad. Sent Moses to free them. And so... Moses frees them. You know the ten plagues that happen. God destroys the Egyptians at the Red Sea. Uh, after he destroys them at the Red Sea, he leads them to a pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, and he gets them out to that mountain, and he says, okay, I now have your full attention. Nobody's chasing you. You have no clue where you're going. So we're going to stop right here and stay right here for a while. He proceeds to give them the commandments. Now, we think about the ten commandments, but he gave them 613 commandments. And he gave them everything a nation would ever need to know. These guys had never been a nation. Do you know the problem God had, generally speaking, with this? These guys had been in slavery for 400 years. You know the problem with that? You think like a slave. You act like a slave. Your expectations are like, It's everything wrong. You, you can't be a great nation when you're thinking like slaves. And so he says, I've got to reshape your thinking. So I'm giving you 613 laws and deal with everything you'll ever need to know as a nation. And they did. This is a comprehensive... These laws took Israel from being a group of slaves to being the greatest nation in the ancient world. And it's because they had all that, and health care was part of it. This is part of what they had. And so we can look at the health care code out of the Bible. And there was a doctor, S. Ivan Millen, who did this. He said, you know, when God gave that code to the, to the Israelites, all the enlightened nations, the, the Egyptians and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, all looked at these Israelites and said, what a bunch of dummies they are. Have you seen their health code? This is backward stuff. He says, but now, 3,800 years later, it turns out God was right way ahead of anybody else. And we now have numerous studies we can put beside all these health care verses to show that God's health care plan was right more than 3,000 years ago. So, see, we had sermons on that. This is a sermon on character and tendency of the property tax adapted to a permanent system of taxation by Reverend George Glover. See, if you go back to the 613 laws, there's a lot of economic stuff there. But I will point out past that, Jesus himself in Matthew 20 covers the minimum wage. and Luke 19, he covers what we call the capital gains tax. You also have Bible verses that deal with the estate tax, the inheritance tax, with capitation taxes, with flat taxes, with progressive taxes. This Bible is full of economic stuff. We had sermons on it for that very reason. This is a sermon on the sinfulness and pernicious nature of gaming. It's preached in front of the legislature of Virginia in 1751. By the way, the sermons I'm showing you are largely from revivals. This is the middle of the first great awakening. The others I showed you, second great awakening. What's going on here? 
A revival occurs when the Bible starts becoming practical again and it affects the way you live and it affects the way you live your life. See, I'm not sure we know what we're praying for when we pray for revival, but this is the outcome. The Bible starts affecting everything you do in life. It shapes the way you think in every area. You find here, this is called a good law sermon on the liquor law of Massachusetts. Try this. What happened was Massachusetts passed a liquor law. Pastor says, here's what the legislature did last week. Here's what the Bible says on that topic. Based on what the Bible says on that topic, that's a good law. Say we just looked at what the legislature did to see whether it was right or wrong, good or bad. And in this case, got it right because it matched what the Bible said. Um, this is a sermon on the injustice and policy of the slave trade. It was the church. It was Christians who led the way on trying to end slavery and starting the abolition movement, trying to get the promise of the declaration that all men are created equal. It, it, it was, wasn't the secular people. It was the religious people who knew God's word that led that way. And then this is a sermon on marriage scripturally considered. It's preached in 1837. And you see at the bottom, on occasion of the new law of marriage going into operation. New Hampshire had passed a law on marriage in the legislature. So on Sunday we say, here's what the legislature did last week. Here's what the Bible says on that topic. Okay, they got it right because it matches what the Bible says. See, we looked at policy from, from God's word. Even this one, it's the other side of the coin. This deals with the fugitive slave law. It's called the Higher Law and its Application in the Fugitive Slave Bill, a sermon, 1851. Of all the millions of laws that have been passed by the federal government, the fugitive slave law is hands down one of the three most wicked laws we've ever had in American history. Now, what happened, the fugitive slave law was passed in 1850. It goes into effect in 1851. I have stacks of sermons on the fugitive slave law from all over the country. And this is the way most of them went. It was real simple. They said, people, are you listening to me? Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Law, and here's what it says. Here's what the Bible says about what that law contains. If you obey the Fugitive Slave Law, you're going to be disobeying the Bible. So if you're going to obey God, you have to disobey the Fugitive Slave Law. These sermons called for civil disobedience all over America on the, on the Fugitive Slave Law resulted in two big innovations. One is what's called jury nullification. When someone was charged under the Fugitive Slave Law and brought to trial and there's a jury there, the jury said, no, nope, not guilty, because if we convict the person under the Fugitive Slave Law, that's an unjust conviction and we're not going to be part of that, they're, they're free. So juries stood up because the Constitution says that a jury can judge both the law and the fact. Not only can the jury decide whether there's guilt or innocence, they can decide whether the law itself was right or wrong. Now, in 1893, the Supreme Court struck that down in a case called Sparf, where they said, no, we judges, we'll look at the law. You guys just decide the facts. But back then, you could strike the law down, and that's what happened across the country, was juries just said, we're not going to enforce that law. That's a wicked law. And it said, by the way, this is the other thing that came out of that law. It started the Underground Railroad. Because of that law, we now had to get people not out of the South into the North. We had to get them out of America and into Canada. And that's what the Underground Railroad did, was took them out of the United States. Because if you're in the United States with this wicked federal law, you're in trouble. You've got to get out of the United States where nobody can reach you. So those are the two things that came from that law. But nonetheless, this all deals with social policy. These are sermons that are common. This is a sermon that deals with what we would call LGBTQ issues. It's a sermon on the cry of Sodom. Uh, this is a sermon on government, which is voting and, and government and all the things that go with it. So we had all these types of sermons. And as John Adams said, our pulpits thundered. This is where we get biblical relevancy. Now, where are we today? We do a lot of national polling. Uh, we know that right now, Bible reading is a real problem in America. Only 9% of Christians read the Bible on a daily basis. So most Christians don't even know what God's Word says about that. As a matter of fact, only 6% have a biblical worldview. So if I take those sermons I just showed you and laid them out, only 1 out of 16 Christians could actually put a Bible verse beside most of those sermons. We don't know what the Bible says on those issues. We don't have a biblical worldview. And as a result, we're seeing a decline in Christianity in America. Uh, in the year 2000, 85% of Americans profess to be Christians. In the year 2020, it was down to 65%. That's a 20% drop in 20 years. That's the wrong direction. So when we pull per people that don't go to church anymore and we say, why don't you go to church? Two out of three say because it has no relevancy. 
I don't get anything at church that applies to me during the week. I don't have anything to help my thinking. And see, this is where people are, are saying, man, it's really bad shape. We need a revival, and we're praying for revival, and that's all good stuff to pray for. I don't think we're going to get the answer we want because we won't recognize it when it does happen. I think God will answer, but it won't be the answer we thought we were getting. And I think the major problem we have is we have an obsession right now with a national focus. Every one of us gets news from somewhere. If you're, if you're on the right side, you're going to get news. I don't know, Fox News, or it may be Blaze, or it may be Epic Times, or Victory News, or it may be Newsmax. And if you're on the left, it's going to be MSNBC or CNN, whatever it is. doesn't matter. You get news, and you get national news. You have never heard a story on Waterton, New York. You've never heard a story on Yukon, Oklahoma, or Jacksboro, Texas, or Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, but you know what's happening in Washington, D.C. You know what's happening with Congress. You know what's happening with the Supreme Court. You know what's happening with the White House. And therefore, I can ask most Americans real easily, who's the President of the United States? And I'll get an answer. And if I ask Americans, <laughs> if I ask Americans, who's the President of your school board? I don't get an answer. If I say, name three legislators who make policy at the national level, I'll get an answer. If I say, name three of your local legislators who make policy on the city council, I'm not going to get an answer. We know about the federal stuff, but you know what? We can't change what's going on at the federal level. We don't know about the local stuff, and that's where we can change things the easiest and the fastest and the best. And so... Just a quick little anecdote on that. Back in the year 2015, December of 2015, ISIS moved into Iraq to set up the caliphate. This is where we're going to set up the, the global caliphate. It's going to be an Islamic world. And so they went in and they started killing Christians like crazy. I mean, it went from 2.5 million Christians in the Middle East down to less than, a, than, than 200,000. It was believed for the first time since Jesus walked the Middle East that we might have no Christians in the Middle East. And so at that point in time, a friend of mine, Glenn Beck, started what was called the Nazarene Fund. Glenn and I run the Nazarene Fund. And over that period of time, we saved hundreds of thousands of Christians out of the Middle East. We sent them to Canada. We sent them to Slovakia. We sent them to Brazil. We sent them to, to all sorts of uh, all, Australia. We couldn't send them to America because America doesn't take persecuted Christians, so we had to send them to other nations. And the guy in charge of our operations was the chief of intelligence for Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. He was the chief of intelligence for Secretary of Defense Gates, and he was National Security Council under Trump. So he is some of the, the top intelligence assets in the world. And he runs our operations. And so when we got to this last year, and what happened this last year, the president said, we're, we're leaving Afghanistan, totally. We're not leaving 25 behind it. 2,500 behind at Bagram, we're leaving Afghanistan. When that happened, we saw the collapse of Afghanistan. And that's where you saw women trying to throw their babies over the barbed wire to get them to America. At that point in time, we got a call from the military, from JSOC, and they said, hey, would you guys take over the evacuation of the civilian population? We'll take care of getting the military stuff. You do the civilian. We said, sure. So three weeks left in August, we took it over, and we got thousands and thousands out. We got 1,200 Americans out. We got thousands of the papers out. We got, we got thousands and thousands of Christians and persecuted minorities out. And it's interesting, at that time, there were 20 different terrorist groups that had moved into Afghanistan. You, you had Al-Qaeda, uh, three. You had ISIS. You had Taliban. You had all these groups. And with all the terrorist groups we had to deal with to get those people out of Afghanistan, the biggest problem we had was the State Department. We had planes in the air. We had a plane in the air going to Macedonia. State Department called ahead and said, don't take that plane, send it back. When it gets sent back, ISIS knows that those are people they're looking for that we're trying to take out. So guess what's happened to them when they get back? We had planes going to Albania. The State Department called Albania and said, don't, don't take those planes, send them back. Guys, you asked us to get them out. And now that we're doing it, you're sending them back to death? So at that point in time, I called a bunch of the U.S. senators and U.S. congressmen that I knew and said, guys, here's what's going on. we got to have help now. We were able to get the prime minister of Pakistan to allow us to bring people in there, even in Pakistan. But we had the State Department block and everything else. And so these senators and reps, they called Secretary of State Blinken and said, hey, this is not right. Let those people out of there. You ask them to do the job, get them out of there. So Secretary of State Blinken called in the Middle East desk and the State Department said, stop this. Let these people get out of there. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. What do you mean you're not going to do that? I mean, Secretary of State. 
You see, at that level of the State Department, they don't answer to any, they don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, they do what they want to do, and by and large, so many in the State Department at that level hate America. They're Marxists and they're socialists and communists, and so we couldn't get it. And so here I am, and I, like other citizens, uh, I couldn't do anything. And I've got connections to the federal law. I've been involved in 13 cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, involved in a case this year. I can't make the court do the right thing. I can't make, so we all get frustrated and we all get angry and we all feel paralyzed because we can't get anything done. And that's where we all are. But you see, we're looking at the wrong level. We should be looking at the local level. Let me show you kind of what goes on when we do. Uh, take you back to the American War for Independence. The first four battles in the American War for Independence, top right going around, top right is Lexington, top left is Concord, bottom left is Road to Boston, bottom right is Bunker Hill. And those four, first four battles in the American War for Independence, like Lexington, we were outnumbered big, 10 to 1. And nobody called George and said, George, you're the national commander-in-chief. We need help, and we need it now. Get us help. Nobody called George in any of those battles because the attitude was, it's our community. We'll take care of that. George, you're really needed at Monmouth and Brandywine and, and Yorktown. You go do that. We'll, we'll take care of the stuff here. More than 80 major battles in the American War for Independence, and nearly all of them were local battles. George was involved in only a handful of battles. Most of them happen at the local level. And so if you take the first one, you take Lexington, April the 19th, 1775, 700 British troops come to town. They're on their way to Concord, but the people in Lexington are saying, we know what they're going to do. They're going to get to Concord. They're going to go into stores, take what they want. They're going to go in homes, take what they want. The British Bill of Rights says they can't do that, but they're doing what they want to do, and we've got to stop them. We've got to protect our brethren in Concord. So we're told in our history books that, 700 courage that 70 courageous Americans went out to face the 700 British that had come to town. And that's not accurate. What happened was Reverend Jonas Clark took his church out to defend the town, and he had 70 men in the church. When they got out there, he had been teaching the men. He said, guys, if we ever get into a war, it can't be an offensive war. God will not bless an offensive war. You can't start anything. Now, if they start something, you have the right of self-defense. Exodus 22, twice in, in Nehemiah over in Luke. But you can't, start, you can't start anything. So when they got out there, their deacon, John Parker, gave them the speech, reminding them what the pastor had said. And this is the Minuteman statue that you find if you go to the Minuteman Park there in Lexington Concord. And the speech was very simple. He says, stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. We're drawing a line, and you're not coming in our communities to do this. It's just not going to happen. Now, we lost the battle big. And I mean big we lost the battle because the problem is if we'd had SEAL Team 6, we still would have lost the battle because you had 700 single-shot muskets shooting at 70 single-shot muskets, and they get the first round. That's why 18 Americans hit the ground that morning. No British hit the ground at all. Now, once they get the Americans swept out of the way, the British move on because they're trying to get to Concord. That's the second battle. When they get to Concord, the textbooks again tell us that some three to 400 courageous Americans went out to face the British. Not accurate. What happened was the Church of the, Rev uh, the, Church of the Reverend William Emerson went out to face the British, and he had between three and, three and 400 guys in his church. When he got the church out there, they took the bridge, said, you're not coming to town. We're going to stop you right here. And by the way, did we hear that you shot at our brethren in Lexington? Are, are, are we at war now? If so, game on. And so that's where the first British hit the ground that morning. The British commander looked at this and said, you know, I faced 70 Americans earlier. I just faced three to 400. I've only got 700. If this thing keeps growing, we're in serious trouble. I've got to have reinforcements. And that's the third battle, the road to Boston. He marched back to Boston on a 19-mile march, rapid march, and they tried to destroy and burn all the American homes as they went, destroying American stuff all the way. So 4,500 Americans show up and line the road on both sides, shoot at the British as they're going by. Now, where'd those guys come from? Reverend Benjamin Balch brought his church out. Reverend Payson Phillips brought his church out. The attitude is it's our community, and we're not going to let you do this in our community. We've got certain rights. We've got a British Bill of Rights, and we're just not going to do it. Even the Battle of Bunker Hill was the same way. Reverend Joseph Willard said, well, I've got two companies here in the church. Let's go across town and get with all the other churches, and we'll, we'll, defend, we'll defend Boston. And that's what the Battle of Bunker Hill was. So what you see throughout is so many local battles. And this is why we won the national war, is we won enough local stuff. Now, we are indeed praying for revival. That's a good prayer. But revival is not going to happen the way we think it is. It's not a national revival. It will be local revival. They said, no, wait a minute. The Great Awakening was a national revival, right? I mean, you had George Whitfield. George Whitfield preached for 34 years. He preached 18,000 sermons. 
And 80% of all Americans physically heard George Whitfield preach a sermon. May I point out that is message penetration. What Twitter and Facebook wouldn't give to have 80% message penetration. <laughs> Even with big tech, they're nowhere close to that. So how did he do that? He was the chaplain in the state of Georgia, and he got on his horse, and he had a portable pulpit he tied on the horse behind him. And he rode all the way to Maine on horseback. Now, Maine was the northern part of Massachusetts back then. Maine didn't become a state until 50 years later. So he rides to Maine, and he preached in every town he went through along the way, had revivals all along the way. When he got there, he turned around and rode back to Georgia, but he took a different route, and he preached in all the towns he went through as he did. When he got to Georgia, he turned around and went back to Maine. He did it seven times, back and forth on horseback, 34 years. The reason 80% of Americans physically heard him preach a sermon is because he's in 80% of the communities in America. And all these local revivals he had, they would break out in local revivals, and then the local pastor would take it. You, you had, for example, in, in Virginia, Reverend Samuel Davies, once it broke out, he kept it going another 19 years. Once a revival broke out in Philadelphia, Reverend Gilbert Tennant kept it going for years. Once a revival broke out in Boston, Samuel Cooper, the guy that John Adams talked about, he kept it going for years. They were all local revivals. And this is what turned into, we call it a national revival because it affected the whole nation. It wasn't a national revival. It was local revivals all over the place. And so again, the focus is on local things. It's looking at local. Now, when you look at civil things, where we are with, with civic engagement, what we look at is voting. And when you look at voting, in America, the Constitution says two things are required before you can vote. You have to be a legal citizen, you have to be 18 years old. 100% of people who are 18 years old and legal citizens can vote. All you have to do is register to vote. That way we know it's you and it's not somebody else and you didn't vote seven times and they didn't vote 18 times and so it's real easy. Only 65.3% of Americans are registered to vote. We have roughly 100 million Americans who have said, I don't care what happens to America, I'm not gonna be part of any of it. Nearly 40 million evangelicals in that group. 40 million evangelicals will win any race in America and we got 40 million sitting on the sideline, I'm not gonna be part of nothing. What you have in the elections, there are two different types of elections in America. The first are what we call presidential elections, that's where you have the highest voter turnout. For the last 11 presidential elections, we've averaged a voter turnout of 58%, but that's 58% of registered voters, that's 58% of 65.3%, which means 36% of adults vote in a presidential election, it takes half of that to win. When you get to the off-year election, which is what we have right now, for the last 21 off-year elections, the average voter turnout is 30, 38%. So 38% in off-year elections, but that 38% of 65%, which means 25% of adults vote for governor, for senator, for congressman. And uh, you guys voted for governor last year, like Virginia, but you'll vote for, for the other federal spots and legislators now. And it takes half of that to win, so you're looking at 13%. So what we're looking at, in the last 11 presidential elections, it's one out of five Americans that chooses the president of the United States, and it's one out of eight Americans that chooses governors and chooses senators and chooses reps. That's not a very high percentage. And then when you get to the local level, it usually runs about 6%. But that's 6% of 65%, which means about 4% of adults vote at the local level, and it takes half of that to win, which is 2%. Let me point you to Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a city, second largest city in America, it is larger than the population of 23 individual states. That's how big it is. So if you're Eric Garcetti, mayor of Los Angeles, that's like being a governor in 23 states. Eric Garcetti is really faith hostile. Churches are definitely not essential. Churches, synagogues, shut them all down. It's interesting, Eric Garcetti brags about the fact that he was elected mayor of Los Angeles with 2.9% of the vote. 2.9%, really? And let me take you to Houston, my state, Texas, fourth largest city in the nation, uh, Anise Parker was elected mayor there, and, and by the way, Houston's larger than 20 states' population, but Anise Parker was elected mayor there, and she was elected with 4.9% of the registered vote, which is 3.3% of adults actually elected her. When she got elected, she's the first open lesbian mayor of Houston, and she passed what was called HERO, that's Houston Equal Rights Ordinance. She said, you know what, you people that say marriage between a man and a woman, that is wrong now. I've just got the law passed. And so she found five pastors she remembered that had talked about marriage being between a man and a woman, and she subpoenaed 17 different forms of their communication. She said, I want to see all your text messages, all your emails, all your voice messages, I want all your social media, I want to see all your sermon notes, I want to see all your published sermons, I want to see all the, the sermons recorded anyway. And she said, if I find that you said marriage between a man and a woman, I have got you, because that's now a crime. 
And so at that point, we got 4,500 churches involved in Houston and said, why don't we have a referendum on this and let the people vote on it? And so we got put on the ballot, and the day before the election, the Houston Chronicle ran a poll and said, we're going to lose big time. It's going to be a 60-40 slap down. People are firmly behind in East Park. They support our policy. We Christians, we're going to slap down. Next day, we had the election, 14% turnout, and we slapped her down by 22 points. It was 61 to 39. Now, understand, the polling missed it by 40%. They said, she's going to win by 20. We won by 22. That's 42% mistake on the polling. Now, Matt point out, 14%, that is pathetic turnout. Yeah, but that's five times higher than what it had been when she was elected. If you just get the Christian vote up a little, it has an exponential impact. And see, that's what happens at that point in time. Um, another example, I take you to Texas. Fort Worth, Texas is the 13th largest city in the nation. And six and a half years ago, the school board of Fort Worth said, you know, we've been looking at gender stuff, and we're not going to do that anymore. Kids can choose whatever bathroom they want. Kids can choose whatever locker room they want. Kids can choose whatever shower they want. We're just not doing the stuff anymore. And Arne Duncan, the secretary of education, said, I should have thought of that. Brilliant idea. He came out with a federal policy that says, if your school gets federal tax dollars, you can't do the gender stuff anymore. And that's 97% of public schools in America. So that changes. And this is particularly disturbing for me because this policy came out of Fort Worth, Texas. That's right near where I live. And if you don't know much about Fort Worth, the nickname of Fort Worth is Cowtown USA. That's what it's called. Twice a day, we shut down Main Street and we drive that herd of Longhorns up and down Main Street twice a day. Big church attraction because this is where the West begins. The, and now, I told you I'm a cowboy. You may not be a cowboy. It doesn't matter. I can take any one of you and put you behind that herd of longhorns, and you can quickly tell me which are the cows, which are the bulls, and which are the steers. It's just not a hard thing to do. And we have never seen a cow become a bull, and we've never seen a bull become a cow. It has never happened. It's, and so, so Cowtown USA does this. So I looked, and there's 918,000 in Fort Worth. And the president of the school board who introduced this silly policy was elected with less than 1,200 votes. As a matter of fact, he's 1,182 votes. So I started looking in the district where he's elected, and I quickly found dozens of evangelical churches there. And I, I found one church in particular, that one church, Bible-believing church, had more than 3,000 Bible-believing registered adults in that church. That one church could have kept that guy from being on the school board, which would have saved the entire nation from six and a half years of gender nonsense that we've gone through. It came out of a local community, went national, could have been solved right there at the local level. Two more examples. If I take you to Bentonville, Arkansas, this is the hometown of Walmart. There's 40,000 people in Bentonville, and a Christian lady said, you're not going to do this in our schools. She ran for school board, and she got elected. In a town of 40,000, there were a total of 35 votes cast in the school board election. She got the majority of the 35. If I take you to Riceville, Iowa, there was a farmer in Riceville, Iowa, who said, uh, you're not going to do this in my town. And so he ran for school board. On election day, he got busy on the farm. Turned out he didn't get to vote on election day. And don't think he lost by one vote because that wasn't the story. The story is not a single person voted in the school board election. Had he voted for himself, he would be on the school board. <laughs> Simply voting for himself. See, this is where you can have impact. Th this is... This is the level at which you can do this, and so this is the local focus. Don't, I mean, the federal stuff is important. We send the right people to the federal level. This is where you start winning the battle. It's down here. You start taking enough victories at local level, you start winning the state, you start winning the nation. Benjamin Rush, I mentioned him earlier, he's called the father of public schools under the Constitution because in 1790 he came out with this piece on the mode of education of property and republic. He said, we used to be 13 different nations, now we're one nation with 13 states. What are we going to have to teach in schools to stay a nation? And so he said the purpose of public schools is threefold. He said the first public purpose of public schools is to teach students to love and serve God. He said the second purpose of public schools is to teach students to love and serve um, their country. And the third purpose of public schools is to teach students to love and serve their family. Notice the order. Nearly every Christian I know would say, Ben, you've got it wrong. It should be God. It should be family. It should be country because family is so much more important. And he said, no, you're wrong. It should be God, it should be country, it should be family, because as he explained, if you ever lose control of your country, your country will become the great enemy of your family. 
and that's what's happened. We've been so busy tending our families, we've lost the country, and now look what's happening with the attacks on our family that we never believed were possible. See, this is where you've got to get involved, and we saw that. You know, Chad, and this, by the way, is, is why we're seeing so much attention on school boards, because we're, in the last three years we've discovered that this is a real cesspool that's going on here, and that's why so many people are running for school board. And if you look at this local focus, Chad mentioned what had happened over in Virginia. And if you look in Virginia, those 312 churches he talked about where Faith Winds got involved, those 312 churches, they registered people in their pews who had never before been registered, and they got them to vote. 77,000 voted out of 312. There's tens of thousands of churches in Virginia. 312, they got 77,000 in the pews that had never before voted to go vote, and Yonkin wins by 63,000 votes. That's the, that's the election right there. But then 1 Timothy says, no one can be crowned unless they run according to the rules. What are the rules of elections? Most of us don't know. So 1,300 people out of those, three, those 312 churches said, we want to learn about elections. So 300 of them became state-trained election officials. 1,000 of them became poll watchers. And they found 5.2% of the ballots to be fraudulent. They found one guy who had registered to vote in 27 different locations. They found a vacant lot where 17 people voted out of the vacant lot. Nobody lives there. Some people can't vote from there. They found 5.2% of the vote being fraudulent. That wins an election, too. Take 5.2% off the table. And then they said, you know, out here in the country, we still have common sense. Up there around Washington, D.C., they've lost their minds. So we in the country are going to have to turn out higher rates to overcome the urban areas where they're just not thinking right. And instead of having a 35% voter turnout in the country, they got it up to 64% voter turnout in the country. That's another reason to win an election. In Colorado, we got 1,500 churches involved in Colorado. We took dozens and dozens of school boards in Colorado. I'll just show you some headlines quickly to go through what's happened in the last couple of years that you probably haven't seen on the news. This one, Canada's imposing critical race theory, COVID-19 mandates when Minnesota school board. Minnesota is not a conservative state. They got a conservative school board now because Christians got involved. Then you, this one's out of Jersey. Out. This one's from here in the state and all the way to Texas. It's got my attention. Headline, 19-year-old who saw his senior year disrupted by COVID shutdowns unseats the incumbent in a school board race. So this kid who is not, he, you, you took my last year away from me. I'm running against you on the school board. He beat the incumbent by 17 points. And Matt, point out, it is really nice to finally have an adult on the school board in Jersey. It's, just, it's, it's really good. Denver took the school board in Denver. Do you know how liberal Denver is? Yeah. Christians, churches got involved. Christians took the school board. Same with Wichita. That's the second most liberal city in Kansas. Christians took the school board. The same with Treasure Valley, which is Boise, most liberal city in Idaho. Christians took the school boards. Dallas, two weeks ago. There were 15 open school board positions in Dallas. We got all 15 of them. 51 churches got involved. We got 15 out of 15. Colorado Springs, four school boards in Colorado Springs took every seat on those four school boards, every, every seat in the election. Houston, Houston's got 2.3 million people. Churches got involved, took all the school board seats in Houston that were up for election. It's this way all over the country. See, these are fights that we're winning, and this will start turning the nation, this kind of stuff right here. So in closing this down, the final thing I'll share with you is Charles Finney. He's in the Second Great Awakening, and Charles Finney, who was part of great revival meetings back then at that point in time, he wrote a book in 1835 on how to have revivals because he believed having a revival was a science. And he believed that you didn't pray for revivals because he took what we call the if-then verses. If you know an if-then verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will do this, then I'll do this. Now, if you want God to do this, don't pray about it. Just do what he told you to do over here. If you do this, then he will do this. He said, that's how you have a revival. You do what he tells you to do, and you're going to get a revival. You don't pray about this. You just do it. So it's the if-then verses. And so this is what he said in lecture number 15. As he's working his way through these verses, lecture number 15, this is what he says. He said, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. Politics are part of a religion, country is this, and Christians must do the duty to their country as part of their duty to God. He said, God will bless or curse this nation according to the course that Christians take in politics. See, this is what we've known for centuries in America. 
We've forgotten it in this generation. And by the way, this was a revival, revival lecture number 15, which he called hindrances to revival. If you want to hinder a revival, stay out of public affairs. You want to have a revival? Get involved in public affairs. And that's where the church has got to get and got to get back to. So if this is new to you, I would recommend to you that you look at the book we have on the table out back, The American Story. It'll have a lot of this history. And there's a Bible called the Founder's Bible, which covers the Bible verses that shaped America. Chad, back to you, sir.